live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe with your host, Chris Smith. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Welcome to the Science Cafe. I hope you're ready for tonight because tonight we're doing it all different. We're doing it all backwards. Normally when we do science cafes, I don't have a mic stand, hold on. And you can, like that. And then you can lean on it, like I'm gonna tell you a joke, but I'm not. Normally in the science cafe, we're grabbing somebody in the world of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, somebody doing cool and interesting work, we bring them into the cafe and we ask them to share a little bit of what their work is. What have you spent your life researching, studying, and can you give us all those nuggets of information in about 20 minutes? And then we turn it over and the audience asks questions, right? So we get this cool dialogue that goes back and forth between the audience and the scientists, professionals that we've invited on stage to share with us. But you could easily forget that they're people, right? They're not just sources of knowledge. They're not just only scientists, right? It's sort of like when you were a kid and you saw your teacher in the grocery store and you realized that they were a real person, right? Like they actually ate food. They lived in the community. They did things other than just teach you science <laughs> five days a week, right? So for tonight, we're doing storytelling. I've decided to call tonight's program In Between the Science, right? What's going on when scientists aren't actively collecting the data, analyzing, writing up their papers, submitting grant proposals, and all the things we hear and read about scientists doing as part of their jobs? What's happening in between discovery? What is life like? What is the mind like of somebody who's working in the sciences? So to do that, I reached out to some cool and interesting science people in the community that are also pretty close to the museum and invited them to actually share stories. So share with us, share with the Science Cafe, something interesting, a crisis, an adventure you went on. Maybe it's just musings that you've had while doing your work, but something that brings out the, the humanity behind the science. And so that's what we're going to do. Tonight we've got three special guests. Each one will come up to the stage in turn and share their story with us. When we get to the end of the night, uh, if you do have questions, something that you think would be interesting to ask, if we got some time, we'll get to those. But tonight is really going to be about hearing stories and engaging with the personal side of what it's like to be a scientist. So I hope that you've strapped yourselves in. If at any point you need to get a refill on your drink, please do so, because I'm sure the Daily Planet Cafe will appreciate it very much. So don't worry about interrupting. I want you guys to enjoy the night as best you can. So our first storyteller tonight is a visiting researcher with the museum, and she's been helping out with research project at North Carolina State. She's a principal scientist for a project called the Urban Slender Loris Project, and the Chile project uh, that's run from Students Discover, which is a project out of the museum. So she's a scientist who's got her sort of like fingers into all sorts of different cool projects happening all over the world, quite literally. So for our first story, put your hands together and welcome to the stage, Kaberi Kar Gupta. Well, thank you, Chris, for introducing me, and thank you, everyone, for being here to listen to the story that I was going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, and hopefully, hopefully, you will like it, and if you have any questions, please let me know. I can answer your questions afterwards, and especially if I know them, I will answer them correctly, otherwise I'll say, oh, maybe I don't know, maybe you have to check it online, or I have to check it and I can tell you later. So today, I am going to take you to India, where I am from, 
and you can see in the picture here, it's, I'm going to talk about a river, which is in central India, called Chamban. And I'm going to talk about village life, doing field work in the river or on the river, and what happened when we were actually doing, went for a field trip with a, research with a researcher and a scientist who were studying otters and a type of, special type of uh, crocodile called gharial, which is only found in India and nowhere else in the world. So it's endemic and endangered. So this was during my master's days when I was doing my MSc in wildlife biology from a renowned institute in India or in Asia called Wildlife Institute of India. And you can do a Google search to see what kind of institute it is. So we were um, only seven of us in the entire program. And those seven of us, it's an intense program. You have to stay there. You cannot go home. And you just stay there for in two years of your time. So we also, part of that, we had to do field, field trips and field works. And it's, a, it's an amazing program where you only do um, about, um, you have to do nine months of field work total in two years. So we went to one of those field trips. And you can see along the river, we went looking for crocodiles, gharials, um, as well as otters. So we had one researcher who was working on radio telemetry and otters. So we went, here is a gharial picture. So we went up, um, went up to the river. And this was a very last day. We were there for about 10 days, very last day of field work, uh, field trip. And we were supposed to be going downstream to see otters in a small, tiny little boat, which had a motor engine. It was not like rowing type. And we thought, oh, wow, it's, you know, it's a engine, motor engine boat, so it's fine, it will be great, and we can go, and we can come back the very first. And next, same day, same night, we are supposed to take um, our, well, not supposed to take, we had our own car, own vehicle, uh, old Ra Range Rover or Land Rover, and we are supposed to go back to our, our institution, which was about 500 kilometers away. So all set, everything was fine. We went in the morning with seven, seven students, our professor and research, researcher, um, research fellow who was working on those otters, and um, field, his two field assistants who were helping him doing the field work. So in between, he stopped. We saw crocodiles. We saw turtles. And then we had our lunch on the river itself. Then we were going to see the otters. So we went to see the otters. And the otters are actually in this very rocky part of the river. The river was kind of shallow. It was in May, so there wasn't a whole lot of water. The monsoon hasn't yet hit India. While coming back, our adventure started. So while coming back, imagine about 10 people in a tiny little boat. And we were quite, it was quite packed. And the engine was getting stuck in the riverbed because there wasn't enough water and it was rocky. So at one point, the engine broke. And the person who was driving, I mean, well, I don't know whether you call it driving, driving the engine, steering the engine, uh, steering the boat, he said, I can fix it. So he fixed it. We thought we are OK. Then about a kilometer upstream, it broke again. And by this time, it was evening. And we were in this part of India, this Chambal River, where it is famous for bandits, or decoits, as we call um, in India. So 
they, these bandits are so well known that there are movies done on them, stories have done, and there are also lots of guns. Unlike rest of India, there, government used to issue them guns for their own safety. And so people are walking around with guns all over, everywhere. So we got really worried, especially our professor got extremely worried about us being stuck in the river with two, two girls. We had seven of us, two girls, and five boys, and the field assistants and researchers. So what to do? He said, well, I'm really worried about the safety of these girls. Um, but then the field, field assistant, one of them, said, I know some villagers, I know some village about a kilo, couple of kilometers away from the river, and I can go and see if we can find a tractor in the village so that they can take us to the place called Morena, who, uh, sorry, Dholpur, where our car was waiting for us, and we have to go back to the city or town called Morena. So we said, OK. So our professor said, OK, you guys should sit all together. And girls, you hide your head under the cap, and under hat, and also keep bamboo sticks with you. And we had also you know, big flashlights. So keep the flashlights in your hand, girls, he said. And we said, OK. So we were like, you know, quietly sitting there, all of us, and pretty scared. And our professor was gone. So then, about like half an hour later, we see somebody carrying a gun and coming towards us. So imagine what we were thinking at the time. We all are set to you know, hit the man with the bamboo stick and the flashlights or whatever we have in our hand. And then we hear our professor coming and saying, yelling at us, saying that, don't worry, he's not a bandit, he's not a decoy, don't have to worry about him. So we said, OK. So we got up, we talked to him, and he. this is the river itself divides two states. One is Madhya Pradesh in one side, and Rajasthan, which is another side. And some of you probably heard the state called Rajasthan, which is supposed to be very, very you know, beautiful and scenic and uh, more of an arid region. So this side, those people actually came to the two villagers, came with guns, of course, with our professors, to take us back to their village. So we said, OK, so we all gone. And it turned out, of course, the village didn't have any electricity or anything, and it was pitch dark. So it turned out that they have never seen anybody from outside their area. And we were outsiders to them because we are from all other parts of India. Sorry, I need to drink some water. So what happens, they said, oh, you have to stay here that night. And we were like, no, well, we have a car waiting for us. We have to go back to there the next day. So they're like, no, because it's a prestigious thing for them that they got villagers. And the next village, did, they got you know, um, people, uh, the guests from other parts of India. And next village don't have anyone. So it's a prestige issue for them. Like, you know, they're very proud of their thing. So they made food for us, and it was probably the best food I have ever eaten. I still remember, you know, these big puris, the round fried bread with, and everything is made in ghee, the clarified butter, with, um, you know, um, uh, potatoes, some kind of potato curry they had made, and. And at the end, they gave us a desert, a rice, desert, rice pudding desert that's made with buffalo milk. You know. So we were quite worried as well as you know, we were scared that what, even though we knew the villagers are very, very hospitable people, but we were just really worried. And at one point, we were just trying to talk to them in broken Hindi because their language is different, Rajasthani, the local dialect they were speaking. 
So they learned that I, this girl, is from Bengal. And it is true I'm from Bengal. And they started saying, oh, that means you are a witch, we can do witchcraft. So for them, any Bengalis, especially Bengali women, are witches. So I had to tell them, hey, no, I'm not a witchcraft. I don't know anything about witchcraft. I can't cure anybody. And that was OK with them. They understood, and it was fine. But they were really, really pressing us that you guys should stay here. The village head came, and everybody was like, you have to stay. And we said, we have to go. So finally, our professor was able to convince them that we have to find a tractor. So the village did not have a tractor. The next, they went to the next village to find a tractor for us. So they found one. The tractor came. By the time we were about to go, it was 12.30 at night. We went, you know, sat behind the tractor, all of us jumped into the tractor. Tractor started moving. Tractor's engine stopped. <laughs> so what to do? Then the, one of the villagers said, there is, a, there is a jeep. You know, jeep is like one of those four-wheel drive vehicles. A jeep coming. Maybe we can stop them and ask them if they would take you to Dholpur. So we said, OK. So the jeep came, and our professor and the local villagers and the field assistant, they were negotiating about money, how much money they are going to take. And meanwhile, we, few of us, two girls and two boys, jumped into the back of the, uh, of the vehicle. You know, we sat there without realizing that they did not finish the negotiation. So what happens? All of a sudden, we see that Jeep is moving with four of us, and our Teachers and, I mean, professor and other friends are not there. So then, you know, we got scared because, again, the bandit area, and we don't know what they would do. So we, imagine at night, pitch dark night, mustard field in both sides with yellow mustard flowers you can see, and the road is pretty narrow, pitch tar road. We jumped out of the moving car all four of us. And of course, we got really nice yelling from our professor, saying that, what kind of foolish idiots you guys are, that you jumped onto this truck, onto this Jeep, without even seeing what we were doing. So we ran through the field. We literally ran through mustard field to come to our professors, because it was quite kind of like half a mile away, probably. And that was an amazing experience, I have to tell you. Running through the mustard fields, yellow mustard fields in dark pitch, dark night. So then we came back. So uh, we, we all got together on the road. And the villagers then decided that, well, about a kilometer and a half away, there is a bus that comes once in every other day from the town called Dholpur. So we probably can go talk to them. And the bus stays there. They come at night. They stay, the bus driver and the conductor, the assistant, stays there in a temple that particular that night. And then next day, they go back. So they said, OK, we can go to this temple, which was a really beautiful, open, nice temple, old temple, village temple. And maybe we can wake the bus driver up and ask him if he can take us to Morena, to Dholpur. So we were walking. Meanwhile, another tractor, another jeep came. And we negotiated, our professor negotiated. He said, 500 rupees, you can take, we can take all of you to Dholpur. So OK, we started moving. We started, you know, got up in the jeep time. All of us together got into the jeep. And the, uh, the jeep started moving about a couple of kilometers away, or a kilometer away, probably, because we still had to walk. Um, the, one of the wheels of the 
um, of the jeep falls off. <laughs> so imagine the adventure, you know, and, and our luck. We were like really, really mad at ourselves, or you know, like what what is happening with us? And um, then eventually, we got out of that thing, and they could not fix it. They were trying to say that, oh, we can fix it. Wait, wait, we can fix it. So we did not give them the money, so that was good. Then we walked to the bus stop, and not bus stop, to the temple. We woke up the bus driver. He was really, really nice and kind person. He said, OK. By this time, it was almost 2 o'clock, with all the drama that's going on, or maybe even more than that. He said, so imagine a person. We are waking him up in the middle of the night. And he was just, it was a warm day, so he was just like sleeping on the floor of the temple. So he was kind enough, he agreed, we will give him 500 rupees and he will take us. So finally, we found somebody who came with us, um, okay, took us in the bus, and the bus ride, even in the middle of the night, you know, going through this mustard field was extremely beautiful. And I saw my first hyena. And I was so excited, you know. I was like, oh my gosh. So I started, you know, shouting, hey, there's a hyena, there's a hyena. And so they were like, what? You, you sing hyena in the field? I said, yeah. So we saw hyena in this field, open field. And then finally, about 4 o'clock in the morning, we reached to the area, to the place where our vehicle was waiting for us to pick us up. Of course, the driver was really worried about us. And that time, you know, of course, I'm talking about 1991. So there was no cell phone or nothing. So he thought that we may must have had some accident or something. So he was really worried. And anyway, so we finally reached there. And those villagers, they actually, three of them, they came all the way to Dholpur with us that night. And what is amazing about this is that the hospitality that we got from them, you know, they have never seen anyone from outside their region. And so we were like a complete strange, not only just strangers, we were like from another country to them. And all the time that we were so worried about, worried about bandits and decoits and, you know, uh, people who are walking around with guns and killing people all over. And you know, uh, there, you would see newspaper stories pretty often. And, but these people were so, so nice. You know, it's amazing to see how, how wonderful those people were. And I would not have experienced, or none of us would have experienced that if we hadn't gone to this village. So even though it was an accident, and we had great adventure, but I was really, really taken aback by those villagers. So at the end, I think that was the best experience we had had my entire master's days, even though we can tell you more stories, things like, you know, having accidents in the middle of Delhi city, or our car broke down in the middle of Himalayas, you know, in the eastern Hima Western Himalayas. But those stories are for another day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Adventure, excitement, all trying to be a scientist. All the stuff that happens, <laughs> trying to be a scientist, getting your master's, yeah. and then the, the boat broke down, the jeep broke down, the bus, oh gosh. Maybe this is why I'm just, I just stand on a stage and I'm not a scientist. People better than me overcame too many obstacles. So our next storyteller is Madhu Kari, or Madhu Sudan Kari. He is an associate professor at NC State. He is dressed like paleontologist Jack Horner. I don't know why. He looks just like the guy 
the Jurassic Park is based off of, right? Y'all like his hat, don't you? Put your hands together. Welcome to the storytelling stage, Madhu Kadi. Thank you. Do you remember the first time you saw a dinosaur? Maybe I look like a dinosaur. But this is a story from when I was in graduate school as well. It's also a story of how doing science as an international scientist with field research sort of gives you a perspective on very different cultures experiencing something in common. But, but from a time when you know, we didn't really have cell phones or social media or you know, the globalization was still in its early days. So I'm going to take you back to 1993 when maybe some of us in the room here, I certainly remember seeing dinosaurs for the first time on a big screen. Right? This was when the movie Jurassic Park came out. I was a graduate student in the University of California in San Diego. I had come to the US for graduate school in 1990, so I was in the early part of my PhD. And my PhD research was on little dinosaurs, living ones, you know, little birds, migratory birds called leaf warblers. Right? Somebody's laughing. They're not dinosaurs, but they are. And we know that for, with, with a fair degree of certainty now. But you know, at that time, we were speculating, and, and I didn't really think of them as dinosaurs. I was studying their migratory ecology, and these are birds in the old world. We call them old world leaf warblers. They're called leaf warblers because they, are, they look kind of like leaves. They're small. They, they weigh about 7 grams. There's about 40 different species, but you'd be hard pressed to tell them apart unless you look at them really closely. These are birds that are called little green jobs. You know, birders will say, maybe you can identify them if you have a good ear and know their songs and if they're actually singing. Or you might look for you know, little sort of wing bars or patterns on their plumage. So you have to look really closely. But these are restless little birds that are usually up in the canopy. So I spent five winters chasing after these birds in southern India. And they, the, the species I was studying, they breed in Central Asia and migrate down to southern India. And my focus was on the winter. And of course, I was a graduate student here in California. So my research basically was also following their migratory patterns. I'd be here when they were off doing their breeding thing in Central Asia. I was in California. And in the autumn, I'd fly back down there and head down and spend the winter trying to catch these birds and watch their behavior, try to understand how they survived and what they did in the winter. And of course, doing field work in remote sites in, in India. I mean, you heard Kaveri's adventures just now. I, I didn't have anything quite that dramatic, but one of the, the amazing things about doing field work in these remote places is that often you, you have to rely on local communities to help you do the work. We tend to think of you know, scientists, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm doing my PhD. I'm the expert. I know all these birds, so I'm going to go, go do the research. But the research is always built on a big community that actually holds you up. So we had, we had the benefit of some amazing field researchers. Actually, Kaveri ended up doing her PhD work at the same site. This is a, a national park near the very southern tip of India, in the Indian Peninsula. Right? If you're familiar with the geography of India at all, this is in the state of Tamil Nadu. I think there are some people from Tamil Nadu in the audience here. <laughs> and uh, this is in the Western Ghats mountains. And so our field site was in the mountains uh, above this rural area. So it, it, back in those days, it was quite a, a trip to reach that place. You know, you, of course, fly from here to, to Chennai. Uh, 
take a train down from there to this place called Tirunal Valley, and then take a bus from there to the entrance, to this village at the entrance of the park, and often find another ride up into the park. And mo when, once we were there, it was a beautiful forest area. We stayed at a, at a forest camp, and it was amazing to do research there. But then, of course, you know, we had the local villagers, and we had this amazing field crew, especially these two guys, Shankaran and Kumar, who became like family to us over the many years. I was there for five winters. They continued to help Kaveri as she studied Loris is there for uh, another five years. And these guys, we tend to think of them, I know, they're local field assistants. That's what we call them, field assistants. And I think that does a, a dis you know, disrespect to their actual knowledge and skills. You know, if it was a just world and if they were actually had the formal advantages that we had, they'd be PhDs somewhere teaching students like we do. But this is the world we are in, so I definitely owe them a lot in terms of our understanding of the local forest and the flora and fauna. And of course, you know, they learned a lot from us as well. So the other part of this is, you know, being in, in these remote places. I, I grew up in Bombay, and India is a very linguistically diverse country. But having grown up in Bombay with, in an English medium school, and you know, then coming off to graduate school and in the sciences, English has become sort of my main language. But in Tamil Nadu, the, the, the local language is Tamil, which is one of the old, original ancient languages from India. So we learned Tamil there to communicate with these people. And our assistants, Shankar and Kumar especially, picked up a smattering of English. They picked up the Latin in terms of the names of birds we would catch. And they really enjoyed learning how to catch birds using mist nets. And they enjoyed, and they would sort of also complain about sometimes they'd get this. We were looking up for a small bird, but when you put up a net in the forest, you catch all kinds of birds. So the birds you know, that they often complained about were these birds called barbets. Anyone know what barbets are? They are uh, about, I guess, this big usually. They have very strong, big beaks because they eat fruits and nuts. So, and they're quite feisty. So if you take them out of the net, it's a fight. And you have to really watch out for their beaks because they could really bite down hard. So, so Kumar and Shankaran didn't really enjoy when they were there, but we had a lot of fun catching birds. But of course, you know, being in the woods is great for us. We romanticize that. It was a lot of fun, but we are also part of the village life, and often we'd even go down to the village with them to see what other activities we do. So this is where Jurassic Park comes in. So I, I had this migratory pattern. I, st I started fieldwork there in 1992, in the winter of 1992-93. So first field season done, I come back to San Diego, and there's a lot of excitement then I realize that Jurassic Park, the movie is coming out. I read the book. We're all excited, grad students, everybody's anticipating this. And this was also at a time when, if you remember, there was a lot of discussion of how the movie was going to be revolutionary in terms of visual graphics and computer design. But they didn't actually reveal any images of the full dinosaurs, right? I actually went back and looked at the old trailers when I was thinking about the story, and I realized, unlike trailers now when they pretty much give away a lot of the movie. This was Spielberg doing a really good job of keeping the dinosaurs under the wraps. You just see a foot, you know, all the water shaking, all these scenes, but no full-scale dinosaur image. And this was also, they're pushing the technological edge. This was the first movie that came out with DTS surround sound, right? New technology for, you know, sound that would shake you in the theaters. They actually opened new theaters with this kind of technology. I remember San Diego, there was a, a new movie theater with sort of this, what's become the norm now is stadium seating, comfortable seats, great sound. And of course, in the first week, all the grad students sort of got, got together. I remember going with a group to watch this movie. Everybody read the book. We knew what the science was. We wanted to see what they were going to show. And I remember the moment when they first are, you know, they drive out into the field and they first see the brachiosaur. You know, it's like that moment when Dr. Grant jumps out of the thing and he, 
rotates the head of Dr. Sattler to look at this real dinosaur. That was a breathtaking moment. And, you know, we enjoyed the film, and the audience gasped and laughed and cheered the T-Rex. And then we came back, and of course, being graduate students in biology and studying evolutionary biology, we also had a lot of nits to pick from this. You know, oh, that's Spielberg. He's not really that great a filmmaker because he just reduced all the humans to one-dimensional characters, you know? They're all caricatures. Scientists don't act like that, right? What was that mathematician flirting with the, <laughs> with the paleontologist and all these silly stuff? What, what's this chaos stuff? So, you know, that's how it goes. When scientists watch movies, we tend to be picky about what they show. So we had fun, and then, of course, it was time for me to go back to India. Now, again, this is a time when you did not have simultaneous release of movies all over the world like you do now. Right? The big blockbuster now, Black Panther, was actually released in other countries before it was released here. That, was, that did not happen in 1993. So Jurassic Park opened in the US in June of 1993. It reached India in April of 1994. And of course, it released in the big cities then, and it took a few months to travel down to the rural area. So in the winter of, or autumn of 94, when I was back for my, I think at that point, third field season, it arrived in Tamil Nadu in, in the villages. So there's villages down in the foothills from this mountain uh, park. And my field assistants had heard about this. There was excitement. They're like, let's go see this movie. It's playing in the local theater. I said, okay, let's go see this. So we, we got on our bicycles, sort of an eight kilometer bike ride in the, for an afternoon show, a late, late afternoon show. And we ride our bikes down. Now, remember, I had seen this in San Diego in the latest technology equipped theater. And I'm in, in Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu is kind of like the movie capital in India, too. I mean, it's not Bollywood exactly, but it's the most film-crazy state in India. It's the state that has elected movie stars as state governor, you know, equivalent of governor. So it's like California in that sense. There's a lot of movies made there, and they have elected movie stars run the politics of the state, even now. So in that context, everybody's movie-crazy. Movie-watching is sort of part of the, a, a, a big part of the culture. We go down there, and it's this big the only theater in that town called Amba Samudram. And it's just, it looks like this big warehouse. And I'd never been in one of those movie theaters. I, you know, I grew up in Bombay, which had good theaters there as well. But we go down there. There's a huge crowd in melee. So my field assistants, Shankar and Kumar, sort of charge into the crowd and go get us tickets. And we sort of stand in this sort of crowded queue to get into the theater. We get in the theater, and it's just this big cavernous hall, and there's no seats. At one end, there's a, there's a cloth screen. Forget DTS. They had two speakers on either side on the ground, big ones, but no seats. I was like, where are we going to sit? Well, look at the ground, and right in the, across the middle, lengthwise, there's a rope, a dividing rope strung across the length of the hall. So I was like, what is this about? Oh, they said, oh, you'll see. So as the crowd rushes in, we realize, I realize that that dividing line is to actually divide men and women on two sides of the theater. And of course, since there are no seats, the theater could literally pack in the crowd. There's no limits on how many tickets they could sell. There's no fire code or anything like that. So, and this was a popular movie. Everybody packs in. You're all sitting on the floor, put it together. And, you know, it, the lights go off. The screen comes on. Now, this is a crowd. This is in rural Tamil Nadu where most people didn't really speak English. Uh, there's Tamil speakers, quite cine literate in terms of the local cinema. But Hollywood movies didn't really come that often there. I'm not sure how, what proportion of the audience actually spoke English. And here we have an American movie. Again, back in the day, 
when they didn't really bother with translations or dubbing or subtitles or anything like that. So it's all these American accents which were unfamiliar to people back then. So I was like, you know, how is this, how is this going to play? And to my astonishment, the audience reaction in many of the key scenes was identical to what I had seen in San Diego. Right? Everybody gasped when the dinosaur first appeared. Well, that's, you know, obvious. Everybody was taken aback when T-Rex showed up. You know, the, the water shaking in the glass and that whole scene. But then they all cheered. Guess what? When do you first cheer in, in Jurassic Park? When the lawyer gets eaten, right? <laughs> you cheer for the T-Rex <laughs> for eating the lawyer as he's sitting in the toilet. And lawyers don't quite have the same cultural connotations in India. But it was amazing that the audience reaction was exactly the same. And from there on, they're rooting for the for T-Rex. You know, they're cheering with the with the kids or rooting for the kids. All the right moments, the same kind of emotional response. And that was when I realized, you know, we had been picking nits and complaining about Spielberg's filmmaking, and I realized that he actually is a genius who had reduced everything to sort of archetypes that resonate across cultures. And in a sense, there was also a lot of science in there, in the, in the movie. So when we finished watching the movie, we rode, you know, it was dark already, so we rode the bikes back in the dark into this tiger reserve where we were staying. And along the way, my field assistants, you know, Kumar and Shankaran, couldn't stop talking. They had all sorts of questions for me. And again, my Tamil wasn't that fluent. They didn't speak English, so I was sort of trying to translate the DNA cloning, you know, all that technology, tech talk in the movie for them, based on my knowledge of the science, into Tamil. So this was a fun bike ride I still remember quite well. And we kept talking about the movie for days afterwards. They were really excited. They wanted to know everything about dinosaur evolution. We talked about dinosaurs, how they were probably the ancestors of birds. And of course, back then, the other nit we might pick about Jurassic Park now is that these dinosaurs didn't have any feathers. Right? We know now that the T-Rex and certainly the Velociraptors should have had feathers. We didn't know that then, but Shankar and Kumar were really into it. And the other thing was, you know, they had grown up in those forests. They knew the forest really well. They had been working with various research projects over the years in this tiger reserve. And they had developed a really strong ethic of conservation. So they were always on the lookout for poaching activities or anything like that. They would go out and confront poachers, report them, you know, do all kinds of things. So one of the things that Shankaran said to me later was that, you know, and we, you know, this is often we sit and talk about various things while you're waiting for birds to get in the net. And I remember him talk, saying, you know, I wish we could get one of those big dinosaurs here. That'll keep the poachers out. <laughs> and we need the dinosaurs to come protect this tiger reserve. <laughs> and we laughed about it. I was like, you know, what will happen to your tigers then? if you have a T-Rex wandering around. But this was an interesting, you know, this is sort of the experience you get of how popular culture and its depictions of science can resonate across cultures in this unexpected kind of way. At least it was unexpected for me. And I still like to think, you know, we have, haven't been in touch with them. It's been many years now, so I finished my PhD in 20, 21 years ago. Uh, Kaberi finished, I think, 17, 15 years ago now. We haven't really been in touch with them. We know once in a while we, we see, and in fact, I think Shankaran's son is on Facebook, so we, we get some updates through there now. Uh, but I like to think that you know they, they must have gone on to see the, the recent reboots of the Jurassic Park franchise. And I wonder, do they realize that all those years they spent with me in the field that they were actually pulling dinosaurs out of the nets. <laughs> and that's the thought that gives me joy to think about it. Thank you. Thank you very much.
I didn't mention at the start that Maru and Kaberi are husband and wife. It's not really critical to the fact that they're scientists and that they both do incredible work, uh, but it's kind of fun because they also have their children here, and the kids didn't know I was going to point them out. We, need <laughs> we won't ask your children about their stories of you. Maybe they want to tell their own. The next time we'll have them up and they can share their stories. The Teen Science Cafe. Get ready, it's gonna happen. So in our first story, Kaberi talked about situations in crisis, but also important cultural exchange that happened. And then the story you just heard was about dinosaurs. Well, sort of, right? Modern day birds are dinosaurs, we learned that. I told him no science, but he did it anyway. You learned that birds are dinosaurs. Maybe you knew that one already. And you definitely threw in the part about velociraptors and feathers. That was some science. Just gonna let you know. And to bring home our in between the science storytelling night, we have historian of science, the head of the history of science research lab here at the Museum of Natural Sciences, someone that a few of you may know and may have heard speak before, Paul Brinkman. Thanks, Chris. All right, so uh, thanks for coming, everybody, and thank you for the introduction, Chris. Uh, I decided when I was invited to do this that uh, it would probably be wise. I see Katie's already smirking. I, she's already anticipated what I'm going to say, maybe. I, I tend to be long-winded when I tell stories, so I thought maybe what I would do, or what I should do in, in the interest of time, is instead of telling you the stories like I enjoy telling them, I'm just going to read from my field journals uh, verbatim. Uh, I might edit out a thing or two. Um, I, I, I've only, I, so I, obviously these were written not for public consumption, these were written by me in real time, just my thoughts about what was going on, that kind of thing. Some of it's, I don't know, funny maybe, some of it's a little odd, um, but these are all, I think, um, somewhat interesting stories at least that paint a picture about how people do vertebrate paleontology field work. So before I was the uh, head of the History of Science Research Lab, I was the assistant head of the Paleontology Research Lab. Uh, and I went, and so when we opened in 2012, we had our inaugural field season that summer in Utah. And this, I chose this journal from that first field expedition that we ever undertook from the Nature Research Center, from the Paleontology Research Lab in 2012 to uh, Southern Utah. So now I'm, I'm going to begin. I'm going to begin at the beginning, right at the first page. So this is uh, 26 July 2012, uh, 10:30 in the morning. Uh, it starts an inauspicious start. So, uh, and this is what it reads: We are stopped at the Firestone store in Asheville, North Carolina, a mere four hours west of Raleigh. Somewhere outside of Newton, we had a blowout on our right rear tire. I was driving the white Suburban, M7, we call all our Suburbans M something, uh, in the left lane when I felt a jolting shudder as though we had just run over, over a fragmentary phytosaur vertebra. That's an inside joke. I won't explain it. <laughs> I looked in the rear view and saw several vehicles swerving to avoid the tread of our, of our tire, shredded and flying behind us. The steering seemed okay, but I quickly pulled over onto the shoulder to check the damage. Much to my surprise, the tire was still fully inflated, yet there was not a trace of tread left on the tire. Alex, Nate, and myself, Alex and Nate were two volunteers. Uh, they don't work here, they, but they volunteered to work that summer with us, so they were, they're, the, they're the butt of many jokes in this journal. Alex, Nate, and myself were all amazed. Unfortunately, the spare tire was flat. So we repacked the back of the truck, piled in, and drove slowly about three miles to the next gas station. I can't believe the tire didn't burst. The other blue Suburban, M11, joined us at the gas station. We filled the spare and changed it. Then we drove 40 or so miles to Firestone. It is sunny and hot. My hands are black with highway grime. Shiny splinters of metal are on my hands from handling the shredded tire. I have a few tiny cuts. 
Lindsay, and Lindsay was the Lindsay was my boss. She was the direct is still the director of the Paleontology Research Lab. She threatened to come tonight, but I see now looking out at the crowd, I see she was too too afraid to come. Too afraid to face the truth. So Lindsay bargains for a new tire while Lisa, who's who replaced me in the lab, while well, Lisa uh, puts a call into Cindy to see who will pay for it, that is to see who will pay for our new tire. This was surprisingly controversial. <laughs> Kate takes some pictures for our blog. Uh, we stand around at the tailgate a little, uh, with little to do. I hear the whir of rotary air tools and the faint sound of classical music playing in the shop. The estimate is 35 minutes or more, so we walk to McDonald's to kill the time. 10.30 a.m., it turns out, is not too early for eating a burger. All right, now I'm going to skip forward a couple days. Uh, now we're in the, f or what's the, sorry, we're arriving in the field. All right, and, and, and the field work we were doing, of course, this was chosen by Lindsay. So Lindsay's a specialist in theropod dinosaurs of the early Cretaceous of North America. So we went to a place in Utah where early Cretaceous rocks are exposed in great abundance. And it was here that we were going to look for fossils. So we're in southern Utah at this point. So Green River, Green River is a town in Utah. Green River is small. I think I've been here before, but I'm not positive. The town looks surprisingly 20th century. Uh, with the exception of an old stone bank. We get some gas and eat at a restaurant in town. I try and fail again to get postcard stamps. We leave town and head west for the field site. Maybe two hours later, we exit the highway at Emory and, and head in the opposite direction. Immediately, we reach the end of pavement. Lindsay drives pell-mell over the twisting, pitted potholed and frankly dangerous dirt roads. We follow as best we can in a cloud of dust. We make a few turns looking for some place that Lindsay and Lisa want to prospect. Lindsay and Lisa had worked previously in this area for the Field Museum. We turn around and backtrack a ways. Eventually we make our way to the shadow of a Dakota-capped hill with mustn't touch its slopes. That's just the name of the various geological units that we were exploring, the mustn't touch it formation. Uh, there is Purple Morrison, another formation nearby, and Entrada underneath, yet another formation. The setting is very beautiful and typical of southern Utah. Here we set up camp. But just as we're unloading the trucks, the wind picks up noticeably. Rain, rain and lightning have been visible on the horizon for more than an hour, but it didn't seem to threaten our position. I suggest we set up the dining flies first. We take them out and begin assembling the poles when the wind really starts to blow. It is exceedingly difficult to stretch the enormous flies over the framework. Straps and guy lines flap madly and twist in the wind. It takes the entire crew to put these two simple structures up and pound in all the stakes. And just in time, too, as the rain starts to fall, first in a sprinkle, then a steady pour. And by the way, I, there's some pictures of the field work uh, that, that Chris is flipping through as I narrate. So there's the two dining flies that I was just describing uh, of being put up. And there's a big puddle of water. Evidently, I took this picture shortly after the storm. All right, Lindsay, and again, she's the leader of the expedition. Lindsay encourages everyone to set up their tents, but I intend to wait for this to blow over. I hang on tightly to the dining flies and watch as the rest of the crew, minus Alex, who eventually joins me, struggle to pitch tents in the storm. An hour later, the wind and rain let up for a time. I make my smoked oyster appetizers in this interval while everyone else scrambles up the slope behind our kitchen looking for fossils. The party returns when the rain begins to fall steadily again. The oysters are only a moderate success. I make one tin only and I wind up eating most of them myself. The rain and wind disappear uh, a short time later and Alex and I set up our tents. I pound my stakes in deeply in anticipation of another big blow, but it never comes. All right, again, I'm skipping ahead and this time I'm skipping many days ahead to 5 August, a Sunday. There are no Sundays in the field, or Saturdays. Every day is Monday. Sunday, 5 August. It was slightly overcast and breezy today at the quarry, which made the work far more pleasant. I began work by helping to repitch the sunshade so that Alex and I, at the end of our excavation, get some shade. Uh, get some relief, sorry. Both of us were much happier with the results. Once the shades were fixed, we settled into work. 
I tackled my femur first. Evidently, I had found a prospect of a femur some days before, and now I'm working on it. All right, so I tackled my femur first. It took most of the morning to excavate and pedestal the bone. I also gave it a, heavy, a healthy dose of Vinac. That's just a plastic glue we apply to fossils to stabilize them in the field. Someone called a break for 11Zs, and I stopped to eat an orange. Some classic blues music was playing on Lisa's iPod, and it was good. An hour or more later, I stopped again to eat a hot sandwich and some dried mangoes. My water is still delightfully cold in my camelback. A, a serious problem in the field, by the way, keeping water cool. After lunch, I lean back with my tilly over my face, my hat. This, I think there's a picture of me wearing the hat. In one of these pictures, I, I forget. I forget the pictures I gave Chris to show. That's, by the way, this is uh, the site of our excavation, and those are the shade structures that we're working under. All right, I took a brief cat nap. Uh, later, I used toilet paper and a damp brush to even out the peaks and valleys on my specimen. I took my time and did a neat and thorough job. That was obviously written for Lindsay's, uh, uh, for Lindsay. Uh, next, I covered the top with about three or four layers of gypsona layered in a crisscrossing pattern. When this set up, when this, when this had set up in about 10 minutes, it seemed firm and stable. I used my rock hammer to tap an all gently under the gypsona covered bone in several places. Once it seemed sufficiently loose, I popped the whole thing off and flipped it over with my bare hands. I spent about 10 minutes then cutting excess matrix off the bottom and trimming the edges to make them smooth and round. I covered the exposed bottom with about two layers of gypsona, then wrapped the entire bone with one very long piece. Once this was set, I wrote the specimen number and a few notes on the jacket and called it finished. All right, again, I'm just jumping ahead slightly to uh, that evening. A storm is skirting camp to the north. Light from the setting sun is turning the falling, sorry, falling rain orange and pink. A short rainbow sh uh, shows to the east. A light breeze is blowing. Uh, we write postcards to our financial sponsors. Uh, this, was, this was a scam to raise more money. It, it didn't work. <laughs> Alex reads. I won't tell you what he was reading, although I did note it here. Uh, I write in my journal. As the last light fades, some make preparations for playing cards. My mood is good. I could use another great night's sleep, however. All right, again, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. This is a few days later, more work in the quarry. So up in the quarry was another routine day of heat and heavy labor. I mapped and packed my phalanx, that's just a, a foot or hand bone. Lisa found an interesting bone. Uh, nobody, seemed, nobody knows exactly what it is. I thought maybe an ilium and part of a sacrum. Around 11 a.m. we had visitors in camp. Don DeBlue, Scott Madsden, Jim Kirkland, and a German student named Steffi stopped in to visit our work uh, and to see their old dig across the hill from ours. We chatted amiably with them for some 30 minutes. Alex flirted shamelessly with the German and even managed to get her phone number. I did not note her phone number in my journal, by the way. Uh, lunch was another highlight because I had leftover pork chop sandwich uh, with an orange and some Oreos. It was good. All right, and now I'm going to skip almost to the end. So this is the, uh, not long before the end of the expedition, I actually took a little break and drove to a, a local town to give a talk. Uh, this, is, this is sort of part of keeping the locals informed about what we're doing and showing that we're, we're doing interesting things in their, you know, in their environs. So I went to give a public talk uh, to the... Um, uh, Southern Utah chapter of some rock hound club. I don't remember anymore. And what I'm describing now is driving back to camp for the last full day in the field. So I've just, I've been, I've gone to town. I stayed in a hotel. I got to take a shower. Uh, I got to go to a restaurant for food, which was nice. Uh, I slept great. And then I'm coming back to rejoin the group uh, for the last full day in, in, uh, in the field. And I'm going to pick it up there. So I park as close to what remains of our unpacked gear as possible and get out. I am showered and well-rested and fueled by bacon, so I'm eager to work. Poor Lisa looks tired and achy, eyes half-closed, clothing soiled, hair akimbo. 
I speak and act energetically, and she seems pained to keep up. I ask about activities in camp, and she regaled me with stories about all that I had missed. The highlight, perhaps, was yesterday's exhausting effort to bring the smaller of two large field jackets from the quarry back to camp. All are tired and sore from the ordeal. My main reason for coming out early is to help get the second jacket down, the second and heavier jacket. First, however, I busy myself packing and hauling camp equipment to the truck. When most of this work is done, and the full complement of field workers is at least present and fed, we, he we head up to the quarry with gloves, rope, straps, and the heavy yellow sled. Uh, there's a picture of us hauling the specimen in the, that's up right now, and that's the heavy yellow sled on the bottom. All right, my reward for missing yesterday's shenanigans is to carry the ladder. The sled doesn't look like much in this picture, but it weighs about 50 pounds, so it's actually, it's actually kind of a difficult slog up, up steep, uh, detritus covered slopes carrying this thing, plus other equipment as well. Oh, nuts, I just lost my page. Let's see. Where was I? There we go. All right, so there was one large, lumpy field jacket awaiting us at the quarry. Best guess is that it weighs about 350 pounds. It weighed 600 pounds. Uh, nobody estimates the weights of these things uh, correctly in the field. I drop the yellow sled, we flip the jacket onto it, and then we all get busy strapping it down and tying ropes and straps to the sled for handholds. Now, uh, now that I'm up here, I realize that I forgot to change into field shoes. I hope this doesn't lead to trouble. Once everything was in readiness, we all picked a spot from which to grab and or drag the sled and attempt a test lift. I hear a lot of groaning as we slowly raise the sled to hip height and take a few staggers under the heavy load. The weight is not the most serious problem for me. It's the height. Uh, I am taller, even significantly taller, than the rest of the crew. Carrying the sled at an uncomfortable, or rather at a comfortable height for the others means bending at the waist for me, a difficult proposition with such a heavy burden. Carrying the beast turns out to be too much trouble, so we mostly dragged it. This, of course, is much easier for me, although it means a tangle of feet and legs and a lot of stumbling over Lindsay as my handhold gets longer and longer from the pulling. We go up and over a few small rises, uh, and then up one long and steep Morrison slope. At the top, we point the sled downhill and drag it as quickly as possible to the bottom. There we rest. We drag the beast horizontally for about 20 yards and get it in position for the final downhill leg, a steep, twisting, rocky trail just above camp. If not for the fact that the rest of the crew traversed this very slope yesterday with a heavy jacket, I would have declared this section unpassable. We set out slowly, working hard to keep the sled from rolling over and pitching our specimen down the steep slope. I worry constantly that someone is going to get crushed. Then Lindsay and I switch places, and I worry that I will get crushed. Alex moves ahead to shove some impressively large boulders off the trail. One is much too large, and I join him, and together we lever it over the edge with our legs. The rest of the trip down is surprisingly easy. I move the truck to a convenient spot, and we slide the sled straight into the back and push the jacket to an empty space directly over, to, over the rear axle. We are all pretty fagged from a job well done. We pack the remaining camp items into the truck and hit the road. I take the lead for now in M7. In town, we stop for an hour for milkshakes. Seldom has ice cream tasted so good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Did y'all have fun? Okay, I did. I got a question. Paul said he would take questions. I'm going to come with a mic. You're in the middle of nowhere in Utah. Where are you getting smoked oysters? <laughs> That's a good question. Okay, good question. Uh, I brought them from home. <laughs> Although, I will say this. So it, as it turns out, and this is a, a little known fact, smoked oysters, uh, as, as well as sardines and other tinned fishes and meats, are actually traditional paleontology field foods. 
So people have been eating that stuff for hundreds of years, well, a hundred years, uh, in the U.S. West while collecting fossils. And in fact, you still find some of those tins, you know, with the old-fashioned key that you peel the metal lid back with. You still find those sometimes at, at old excavations. Uh, Katie is waving frantically. Is there a problem? So, so they were No, there's a question in the back. They weren't, they I'm not weren't. finished with this question. Just a detail, small detail. They weren't prairie oysters. They, they weren't what? They weren't, prairie, they weren't prairie oysters? No. No, these were traditional oysters. Um, there's actually, uh, uh, do we have time? Uh, there's actually a good story about this recipe. If, a recipe for? For the smoked oyster appetizers that I served. 90 seconds. 90 seconds, I can do it. All right, so the first time I ever went in the field with, um, n no more gestures, Katie. The first time I went in the field with uh, the Field Museum, uh, back when I was, a, I guess I was a graduate student then, uh, so I was a bit of a rookie. I had never been in the field professionally before. I'd collected a few fossils, of course, but I've never been on a, a real expedition. So I was, you know, I was trying to impress. But of course, I wasn't acclimated to these kinds of conditions, and I found the work itself brutally hard. It was really hot. You could never get cool. It was a lot of walking and a lot of heavy lifting and a lot of frustration. Now, anybody who's done field work of this kind, they know exactly what I'm talking about. And so maybe, I don't know, a week into the expedition, I haven't found anything great. I'm exhausted. I'm hot. And one day, one morning, I'm having a particularly bad time, not finding anything, and I decide to quit a little early. So I come in maybe 11.30. And of course, there's not, not, a, not a, so much as a square inch of shade anywhere in these badlands. This is in southern Wyoming. So I crawled under the truck. That was really the only place to get any shade. I crawl under the truck, and, I'm, and I took a quick nap. And uh, after a while, I was, you know, I was thinking, well, it's going to be a while before anybody else comes in, so I've got some time. But sure enough, someone else came in early, too. And so now I'm trapped under the truck. And I don't want anybody to know that I've been down here napping. So I just sort of quietly waited for an opportunity to sneak out the other side and just pop up and say, oh, yeah, I just came in. Uh, so I'm, I'm down there waiting, waiting. I hear a lot of, you know, activity going on. The, the, the tailgate of the truck is open. Stuff's being shifted around. Something is obviously being done with our equipment. And after a while, I'm starting to think, okay, I'm never going to get a chance to get out of here. Other people are going to come in. After a while, I'm, I'm just sitting there wondering, should I just come out? And then suddenly, a tray appears, like a serving tray appears under the truck, covered with these um, smoked oyster appetizers. And they're made with Triscuits, uh, sour cream. You should write this down. Triscuits, sour cream, a smoked oyster, and a little, about an inch of scallion. Delicious, right? And, and it's actually harder to find um, the, the uh, sour cream than the oysters. So uh, uh, this tray shows up, and m one of my companions says, Appetizer? And uh, so what was I going to do? I took one. And it was, it was delicious. And ever since then, my tradition in the field is always to make these smoked oyster appetizers on the first day. Uh, but what's funny is that you know, I, I often go out with other people who've never been in the field before, and they're all, they, they've also never eaten oysters, and they're all afraid to eat them. And that's why I wind up eating probably 90% of my smoked oyster appetizers myself. Round of applause for smoked oysters. Not for Paul. No, I'm teasing. Everybody, I want you to give one more round of applause, please, for Kaveri, for Madhu, and for Paul. Thank them for coming out and sharing their stories with us tonight. I hope you enjoyed this sort of special installment of the Science Cafe to give you a new perspective on what it's like to be a scientist, to do work in the field especially. And I hope you, that you enjoyed tonight's program. If you didn't, don't tell me, just put it on the feedback forms, because it'll break my heart. But you can write it down, and I won't know who said it. I'm teasing. But do fill out the feedback forms if you enjoyed the program, or if you didn't. That helps us make sure that we're giving you the best programming possible. And we'll see you next week for the Science Cafe. Good night, everybody. <laughs>